Welcome to Public Health On Call, a podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, where we bring evidence, experience, and perspective to make sense of today's leading health challenges. If you have questions or ideas for us, please send an email to publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. Hi, I'm Lindsay Smith-Rogers, producer of Public Health on Call. Last fall, we partnered with the Stoop Storytelling Series to present an evening of stories about the personal impacts of public health. We're releasing some of those recorded stories as a series, and today, in part three, we hear from Ashley Esposito, a litter picker with Be More Trash Pickers, who talks about the stories that trash can tell about the health of a community. We also hear from Dr. Stephen Thomas, director of the Maryland Center for Health Equity at the University of Maryland School of Public Health in College Park, and founder of the Barbershop Project, who talks about the power of barbershops as places of health education. Let's listen. Our next storyteller is Ashley Esposito, who is a wife, mom, and geriatric millennial living in Southwest Baltimore. She is a neurodivergent software developer who enjoys quality time picking up litter, which we're gonna hear about, and hyping up bumblebees that visit her garden. Please welcome Ashley. Okay, so I'm originally from Arizona, which means I grew up being very in tune with like nature and like uh, personal responsibility. Like I grew up in a really rural area. So when I moved to the East Coast, I was like shocked like how much litter there was. Like I was like, oh my gosh, my eye is twitching. Like I cannot. So I ended up becoming a litter picker for cardio first. Like, cause I was like, I just want to like start running around and like doing something with my life. So, and then also because the litter was bothering me and I found this whole community uh, and now I'm the admin. So I'm kind of like the leader of these people, <laughs> but I'm in a group called Be More Trash Pickers and we, yay. Oh my gosh, there's people here. <laughs> And so we basically like post pictures of when we pick up litter, like our litter finds, like we have group litter picking days. (laughs) And it does really like tell a big story about uh, the mental wellness of our communities. Like there's so many stories that are told in the litter, which is wild. So one of the most common things that I probably pick up is like bottles or cigarettes, which tells me one single use plastic is trash. And also if there's a lot of cigarettes then people are really stressed. But during the pandemic, you also saw an uptick in certain things. So syringes and just alcohol bottles, like all these different things that were in the litter. So, you know, when I think about you know, what we need to do. One of the things I definitely think we need to do is address the disproportionate access of uh, like city services in communities. Cause the more affluent areas definitely have different services from DPW. And so, you know, I do see a lot of folks going into communities that they don't belong to, you know, to p- ascend on them and pick up their litter and try to like, not really understanding like the story and the impact that that has. Um, And so I do, there's value in the letter. It may not be the sexiest work, (laughs) but you know, I think that that's where a lot of the community work comes from. That's where you meet people. That's where you, you know, like I said, you're able to see the stories of what's actually happening in your community. And you end up, also getting on the path of pushing elected officials to fix these issues. So I think all things start with trash. So grab your litter pickers and join our cult. (laughs) Stephen B. Thomas, PhD, is a professor of health policy and management and director of the Maryland Center for Health Equity at the University of Maryland School of Public Health in College Park. Stephen. That's my big sister calling me. It's my turn. And then my big brother comes and says, it'll be all right. 
I said, but you go to a real barber shop. And I got to go downstairs to the basement. And there was my dad waiting for me. He had this big chest. It was my grandmother's. She carried it from down south to the north. He told me it was full of the warmth of other suns. I didn't realize that until now. And so I had to get up on this chest and he had to help me up. A little light bulb and then the clippers started. <laughs> and here I am today realizing that in that chest, getting my hair cut, he was giving me the wisdom of surviving in America. All the little things you need to know. And when I got big enough to go to a real barbershop, I saw the same kind of sacred space. But the, there was a haircut that changed the arc of my career. Now, I have to tell my friends here that no self-respecting black barber would ever say, I'll get you out in 10 minutes. <laughs> You're going to be there no matter how much hair you have. <laughs> You're going to be there half a day. You're catching up on the sports. You're talking family. Music's playing. TV's on the wall. All, chain, all to a different channel. And everybody's talking. And then I'm sitting there, and Joe walks in. Hey, Joe, where you been? People hadn't seen him. They're looking out after each other. He said, I've been in the hospital. They told me I had a heart attack. Then they kept me for three days. Now, I'm sitting there as a public health professional knowing that the hospitals want to get you out as soon as possible. But if they kept you for three days, it must be serious. He sits in the chair. Everybody's listening. He pulls out a bottle. I knew it was a prescription. He said, the doctor told me I have to take these pills the rest of my life. And the barber said, everybody's listening. Joe, you take those pills. You won't be able to keep up your obligations. Uh, do I need to tell my white friends what that's all about? <laughs> do, do I need to tell you what obligations are? <laughs> and I looked at Joe's face. He's not taking those pills. His doctor, prescription, diagnosis, he filled the prescription. His doctor has no idea. There's somebody in the community with that level of trust. And Joe will stop going to the doctor because he's embarrassed he's not taking those pills. And I said, what if the barber worked with us? What if the barber would have said, hey, Joe, if you're experiencing side effects, <laughs> erectile dysfunction, <laughs> tell your doctor they may be able to do something. And that was born hair. Health Advocates in Reach and Research. And over the past decade, we've been bringing clinicians and others into the barbershops to train our barbers and stylists as certified community health workers. <laughs> and then, yeah, I'll give them some steps. And then the pandemic hit. I was having a hard time getting my clinical partners even answer my phone. But the pandemic hit and hyperlocal mattered. And so in the state of Maryland, in Prince George's County, we did the very first FDA-approved COVID saliva test anywhere in the country in a barber shop. And when the vaccines came out, we were the first in the country to give a COVID vaccine in a barber shop. Wow! <laughs> now, you know, I wish the Baltimore Sun would cover some of our work, but they think we're in a different state down there in Prince George's County. <laughs> but at any rate, my local paper is the Washington Post. So guess what? Post, New York Times, we're all over the paper and the phone rings. 
It's the White House. We've been watching what you're doing out there. Do you think you can scale this? And the rest is history. Over a thousand shops across the country. There's a live stream web webinar going on right now. I came down to share with you my stoop story about what it means to transform barbershops and beauty salons into trusted information centers. Recognizing that when you give people the information they need, they will naturally gravitate towards saving their own lives. You know what? We had people who came hesitant, and they left hesitant, but fascinated. <laughs> you know what? When you come to our clinics, you're not coming to a hospital, you're coming to a party. We got DJs, we got music, we got, we've got comic books, we've, listen, message from the barbershop, pandemic's not over. It's not over with us. Nobody wants to go back to normal, because going back to normal for far too many people of color means living sicker and dying younger. Let's work together. I'll go back to the wisdom I've seen in the chair, to the wisdom I saw on that chest. It still works. It's a sacred space. So whatever you do, if you get motivated, don't break it. We need you. Thank you very much. Public Health On Call is a podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, produced by Joshua Sharfstein, Lindsay Smith-Rogers, and Stephanie Desmond. Audio production by J.B. Arbogast, Holly Cardinal, Philip Porter, Spencer Greer, and Matthew Martin, with support from Chip Hickey. Distribution by Nick Moran. Production support from Catherine Ricardo. Social media run by Grace Fernandez and Shian Briscoe. If you have questions or ideas for us, please send an email to publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. Thank you for listening. <laughs>